Thanks for inviting me here uh, to talk to you guys and uh, for the gracious introduction. So uh, for I'll start the session by just giving you a, a background of Southeast Asia uh, and the startup ecosystem in particular. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar what, with what's happening there, so I'll, I'll spend uh, half the time talking about that. And then the other half talking about us, uh, I'm the managing partner at Tech Growth Ventures. We're a growth accelerator. And uh, we'll share some experiences of what uh, we do in trying to help US companies accelerate into Southeast Asia and vice versa, helping Southeast Asian companies accelerate into the US. Um, the reason why I'm using a, a picture of the rainforest in Southeast Asia is because it is a tropical place, uh, but also because um, you know, the, the, book, the rainforest book about, you know, Silicon Valley and creation of the ecosystems. And um, although I would like to say that Southeast Asia is at a stage where it's like a rainforest in, in, in having diversity and having uncontrolled growth of startups, it's not quite there yet. Uh, it's more like a plantation. If you've read, if you've read the book, you know, a plantation is where governments come in and they plant trees and crops and they, they decide, you know, who's early stage and who's growth stage. And they hope that they can architect the ecosystem and create, at the end of the day, a rainforest. But it's not quite there yet. Hopefully, it will get there soon. Um, so uh, let me just start with a primer on Southeast Asia. So what I mean are the 10 companies that comprise what we call ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Uh, the biggest ones are Indonesia, with about 260 million people. Second largest is the Philippines, with about 95 million. Uh, Malaysia, Thailand follows that. And then they have smaller countries like Laos, Myanmar, uh, Cambodia, and, um, and Brunei. But these represent a grouping of uh, countries that are different from China, of course, uh, different from um, India and Bangladesh, and of course different from the rest of North Asia, Korea, and Japan. Um, collectively, as uh, Richard has mentioned, the population is 617 million. Uh, it represents 9% of global population. Uh, it's, uh, as a grouping, it is number three behind India and China, and much larger than the US. Um, its foreign uh, direct investment per capita is about $150. That is actually on par with China, which has doubled the population of 1.2 billion people, and several times that per capita compared to India. So there's a lot of foreign direct investment that's going in there, uh, and that's sort of is because of the growth potential that uh, Richard was talking about earlier. Um, there's a growing middle class. There are about five, 55 million uh, middle class households and growing. 199 million online users. Um, and mobile is huge, right? Almost 700 million mobile users, more than 100% uh, penetration. That means there are more phones per person, more than one phone per person. And very social group. Uh, over. 72% of people are on some kind of a social network. A lot of it is Facebook, Twitter. Uh, They're not banned in Southeast Asia for the most part. Uh, and so there's very, very large usage of social networks. So this creates uh, really a really large greenfield opportunity that is really developing very, very quickly. Um, uh, this is a bit of an eye chart, but let me walk you through it. A lot of people say, well, so what does that mean in terms of startup opportunities? So, uh, this is a map, and, and I'll go through the map. Just I'll just highlight some of the findings, right? It's a map of startup opportunities by country, by market segment. So on the left, you have market segments like deal sites, uh, communications like uh, messaging, uh, messaging uh, apps, search capabilities, uh, listings like Craigslist, blogging sites. So that's on the left. And then vertically, there are six of the largest countries. And basically, the heat map shows how saturated is that segment in that country? Red is very saturated. Green is basically at infancy stage. So you can see that there are various segments like deal sites, Groupon type deals, communications like messaging, and search like Google and, and others saturated across the region. Right? But look at the rest of it. It's largely green. So when I say green feel, I mean it is green across the top six countries in the region and across many, many of the market segments. So that's one, one uh, finding. The other finding is that um, if you look at the highlighted areas and boxes on the red on the left, um, uh, before I go into what they are, they represent, oh, by the way, uh, the, the names inside each box represents the top player in that segment for that country. So for example, um, the top news site in the Philippines is Rappler. 
which is a local player, right? Uh, you know, the top uh, Philippines deals player is called Metro Deal, which is another local player. Um, now, what is evident is that if you look at the highlighted boxes on the left, um, these are segments where there are local players, regional players, and global players all active within that country. So new sites, gaming sites, online retail, rentals, dining, travel, all of them are very hot because every kind of player is active in that country. A local player only, a regional player that perhaps is out of another country, and then of course a global player from the US or Europe. So it shows that these highlighted areas are the most interesting. They're the hottest because every type of player is playing in it, right? Um, so I would say in summary, uh, if you wanted to understand uh, what the opp opportunities are by segment, this is one place that you can look at it. But in general, there's a lot of greenfield opportunity and there are still many segments which there are the, where there are only local players involved, which means there's opportunity for consolidation. Typically, that consolidation happens when a global player like Facebook or Groupon goes in and acquires these players and then and gets a regional foothold. Just to be clear, are you comfortable with us sharing this slide on our website or yes. will it be? No, this, this, this will be. We can use this. So yeah. we'll post the slides yeah. on asia.stanford.edu so you'll be able to see this in yeah. detail. Yeah, I, I, you obviously you don't have time to go through the details, but the idea is that there's a lot of greenfield opportunity and this, this tells you where they are. Um, there is a growing number of tech M&A exits. Um, this is a report by one of the venture firms there called Monks Hill Ventures, which is a new player in the market. And over the last six years, uh, you see on the top left number of acquisitions that has been growing. And last year in 2013, there were 24 acquisitions. Um, First half of this year, uh, we're already at 16. Um, the transaction amounts have been increasing. If you look at the table on the top right, the country w which has had the most companies being acquired has been Singapore uh, over that period. 32 companies have been acquired. Uh, total disclosed acquisition amount is half a billion dollars. Um, the second to that, I would say, is probably um, Malaysia in terms of having the largest number of disclosed uh, amount, the largest total uh, disclosed amount of the acquisition. So it has only 12 number of companies acquired, but it has the largest amount of, of, of total amount of acquisition dollars. Uh, so you can see that there is a growing uh, M&A path. Um, uh, uh, these are just some examples of more, some of the recent M&A in Singapore. There's a company called Nonstop Games that was acquired by Candy Crush Saga Maker King in the UK. Zopim acquired by Zentech in the US for 30 mil. Viki, uh, more, the most recent one, acquired by Rakuten in Japan for 200 million. And some other ones I would highlight, uh, there are some in Indonesia, and then in Malaysia are some of the biggest M&As. Uh, Job Street was acquired by Seek, which is an Australian company for half a billion dollars. And then Malaysia Online uh, is an e-commerce player which just listed on NASDAQ to raise 300 million dollars. So in general, with some exceptions, most of the M&As have been below $100 million. So certainly these are not large deals. Um, the second thing to note is that there are a growing number of acquirers that are Asian from Japan, from Korea, right, from Australia. They are the ones doing the acquisitions rather than just the, 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 the typical American companies. So you're seeing now that with the rise of Asia, you now have larger, country, uh, larger companies out of Japan, China, Korea that are starting to acquire all these smaller players in Southeast Asia, okay? So let me go into detail uh, in two of the largest and most developed startup ecosystems. The first is Singapore and the other is Malaysia. Uh, a bit of an eye chart, but I'll just walk you through it. So the Singapore ecosystem on one slide, startups, looks like this. Uh, one big player and a key enabler to make it happen is the government. Uh, very unlike the US, where we basically stay as far away as possible, except when we're asking them to open up a patent office. But otherwise, we want the government. In Southeast Asia, if the government doesn't step in, basically the ecosystem cannot, uh, cannot take off. So the key players in the Singapore government that, make, that, that create the startup ecosystem is um, IDA. That's the Infocom Development Authority. They're the agency that drives IT, the IT sector. Um, NRF, National Research Foundation, so they are the R&D agency in Singapore. Uh, uh, Spring, which is the SME agency, so they're in charge of all small medium enterprises. 
one, one segment of which is tech startups. So they've been playing uh, you know, you know, a, a large role. They've actually built up a large and growing list of investors. Um, if you look at um, a venture capital, right? Um, they're, they, 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 they're trying to attract many regional VCs and even US VCs to open up office in Singapore. And they do this by offering incentives. So either doing co-matching uh, investments on a deal-by-deal -deal basis, or they actually set up funds on a 50-50 on a basis. So a lot of investors have actually been attracted to, to open up there. So you know, this is a pretty long list of 30 or so investors. Uh, some of the ones that have US, uh, uh, that come from the US are, um, just looking at this uh, myself, um, Sequoia obviously and on, the, on the large side, but even in the smaller early stage side, you've got Golden Gate Ventures, which is from the US. Um, <laughs> I'm missing one more. But anyway, there are a couple of US ones that have, that, that have actually taken advantage of some of these incentives and started opening up shop uh, in, in Singapore. Uh, so in general, if you look at early stage and growth stage venture capital, there is sufficient early stage uh, VC funds in Singapore, which actually is not just for Singapore, but of course they invest across the region. However, the growth stage, meaning Series A and beyond, there's still a lack of funding. And sometimes the VCs complain that there are not enough investable startups. That's the reason why there aren't more growth stage funding available there. But if you talk to the startups that are at growth stage, they're saying the VCs don't understand the game, right? So it's always uh, the same, same old, same old, the push pull, right? Um, the co-working spaces, they're sprouting up all over the place. So certainly there's a lot of physical communities now being created in Singapore. Startups are flocking there, not only from Singapore, but from across the region because they want to be co-working together with uh, this active community. Um, generally, if you're a Singapore startup, you're targeting the regional market uh, or even the global market. You're never targeting the local market because Singapore is too small, right? So they have to be global from day one. Um, uh, there are accelerators that are growing. Um, accelerators are very interesting. The government offers accelerators 70% uh, subsidy of their operating cost. So if you open up an accelerator in Singapore and you're selected to be a qualified one, 70% of your operating budget, it gets paid for by the government. On top of that, if you run a program, for example, you run a three-month acceleration program with mentorship, you know, office space, you, you name it, the government could sponsor the cost of these additional programs. Um, so it's very attractive, right? They want to get a, many, many accelerators to op, you know, open up shop, trying to complicate the YC model, co to copy the, the, the YC model and the Techstars model in Singapore. Some of the US players that have, that have taken advantage of that are people like Plug and Play and the Foundry Institute, both of whom are in Singapore already for the last couple of years. Finally, at the bottom networking events, uh, Singapore has established itself as a startup hub as far as events are concerned. So some of the largest events uh, for the region for startups are happening in Singapore and some of the big players like Demo here are already doing their their uh, show in, in uh, Singapore. So before you go on, mm -hmm. I, I know we said that we'd do questions at the end, but yeah. you mentioned that most of the, of the startup companies are aiming at regional markets. Yes. Um, what percentage would you say you're really trying to use Singapore as a jump off place for mainland China? or versus really looking at Southeast Asia? Any idea or just you know, kind of impression? Uh, it, my impression is that uh, if you wanted to go into the China market, you shouldn't spend you should be time in, China. in Singapore. You should be in China. Okay. At, at this day and age, you should be in China. Yeah. Maybe 10 years ago, you would have been in Singapore. Yeah. But those days are gone. <laughs> so the Singapore startups are that act of really looking at the Southeast Asia markets. Well, uh, so uh, conversely, when you, when, when you ask a Singapore startup how would they want to grow their business, I, I will cover this a bit later. <laughs> yeah, okay. But okay. typically, as a Singaporean startup or a Malaysian startup, there are three strategic options when you get growth stage. You come here and you become an American company and hopefully get a chance of becoming global. That's option one. But in, that means you uproot the whole company, you basically become a US company. Second strategic option, is to expand into China because they know that Southeast Asia is too fragmented and if they were to choose the next biggest market, it would be China. And because there's some cultural affinity, but it's difficult to get into China. 
Third is just to stay a regional com uh, company and just try to expand into Indonesia, expand into the Philippines, and get to a large enough market share that you will get acquired, which is, which is already happening, as you saw in one of them. So these are the three strategic options. And I'll talk a little bit about some experience I've had when I talk to South Singaporean or Malaysian startups when they come and say, Winston, so which one should we do? Yeah. Right. It's a di difficult question. <laughs> OK. Uh, some of the stars uh, in, in, uh, in Singapore startups uh, uh, won't go through the details. But in general, you see that most of the stars are in e-commerce or in payment, which are two of the biggest and hottest segments that you saw in the eye chart that I, that I, that I mentioned earlier. So this is just because of the growth of the middle class, online access, mobile access, that people are starting to want to buy stuff. And they want to buy stuff online, just like when, what they did here 10, 15 years ago. So these are the biggest stars. Um, what have we done, uh, Tech Grow Ventures? So back in March, we hosted uh, Spring, which is the government agency driving uh, startups. Uh, they brought along two incubators from Singapore. One is Singapore Management University. Uh, who has their own incubator, and then uh, IXL, which is another incubator. And they brought along eight startups. Um, so these eight startups are not your typical early stage. They already have product. They already have revenues. They are already regional, right? But they've never been into the US market, OK? So they are beyond an accelerator program, like what we typically would see in a YC or a Techstars or a 500 startups. They're beyond that. They're beyond that from a Southeast Asian standpoint. They've actually probably gone through some of these accelerators in Southeast Asia. What they want to do is come here and look for market entry, because as I said, this is one of the strategic options for them. Um, one example is Quantin, is a video interviewing platform. So what they do is they build a database of job applicants who do a video interview, right? And they answer you know, specific questions. And they build this large database, and they offer that as a subscription to employers that are looking to hire people now with video uh, as a screen, right, before they bring them in for a face-to-face. -face. They are the leading uh, uh, video interviewing platform in Southeast Asia, and they've only got one competitor in the US. So you know, some of these companies are very innovative. They're not just me too kind of companies. Now, and the challenges these companies face, so what are they looking here when they say US market entry? They're looking for customer development. They're looking for strategic partners. And of course, they're looking for funding to grow. right? Um, they're not here to look for education. They're not here to look for a YC type program. They're beyond that. right? But they don't have the money to invest and, and, and to grow into, a, into China, let alone the US, unless they get some investment. The challenges they face is that, number one, um, uh, without any local presence, without any market traction, you're not going to get funding, right? Number two, the early stage, uh, the, most of the accelerators here can't help them because they just love the early stage companies. They don't want to talk to somebody that is already growth stage, right? And you know, it's, it's a mismatch. And the other accelerators are mostly only helping them with networking and in funding pitch events. They can't help them with business development, which is what these guys need. Um, let me see whether there were any other challenges. I thought I would, there was another challenge that I saw that, I, that, I, that we've learned in uh, working with some of these companies. Um, sorry. Yeah, and the third biggest uh, challenge is US investors don't understand Southeast Asia. And some of them can't invest in Southeast Asia, even though they have a, an active fund, just because their funds are supposed to be US-centric. So this is the challenge, challenges that they face. And I said, as I said before, for these types of growth stage companies from Singapore, there are only these three strategic options. right? They usually retreat back to Asia and either expand into China or just stay within Southeast Asia, which I think is a missed opportunity. Uh, now let me talk about Malaysia in detail as well. Uh, I'm from Malaysia, by the way. Um, uh, so there, similarly, the government has played a very significant role. Um, uh, Magic is an agency that is a sort of one-stop shop for entrepreneurs, uh, which just launched this year. SME Corp is very similar. It, it runs uh, small, medium enterprises in Malaysia. MDEC is the IT agency. Uh, and Cradle is an early stage um, grant uh, funding uh, entity. So they've been playing a very significant role in starting to build up uh, an ecosystem in Malaysia. Um, the venture capital for Series A and beyond, the growth stage uh, uh, capital, 
has been mostly government funded, right? There are very few foreign VCs at the growth stage in Malaysia. So MAFCAP is the national uh, VC, you know, the money comes from the, the government. First floor capital is also money coming from the government. And almost all the other players that you see in the top right hand box are players that are local that have money coming from the government. So they're outsourced their, 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 their VC funds to some of these players. There are very few uh, big, big players outside of Malaysia. And the early stage venture uh, is just very nascent right now. So Catcher Group just launched a fund, 150 million US dollars. They're a private entity. Um, but the rest of them, 500 startups actually runs a small uh, side fund called the 500 Durians Fund. I don't know whether you know durian is a fruit that comes from Southeast Asia, so they call themselves 500 Durians. Part of that money comes from the government, but they basically focus on, on early stage entities. But they're very, you know, it's very nascent space. Incubators and accelerators, um, you know, you've got, uh, you know, a handful of them, 100, 1337 Accelerator, Mad Incubator, and then there are some uh, US ones like Bootstrap Labs and Founder Institute that are also in Malaysia now. So I would say that um, in general, uh, the ecosystem in Malaysia is a lot smaller than Singapore, but it, the government is putting a lot of effort in trying to build it up uh, over time. So some of the stars in Malaysia, um, I will, you know, this is just data from uh, uh, March of last year, but if you look at um, uh, publicly <coughs> listed companies in Southeast Asia um, that are tech, uh, six out of the top uh, seven are Malaysian in terms of uh, capitalization. So you can see that even though the, num the ecosystem is not as large for startups in Malaysia, but some of the biggest players in Southeast Asia actually have been Malaysian. Uh, I won't go into all the details, but uh, if you, in summary, the, most, uh, the, the sectors that are the hardest are job, job listings, which is Job Street. That was the company that was acquired for uh, half a billion dollars. And then the rest of them are various types of e-commerce sites, right? So, there's a lot of, there are a lot of stars in Malaysia too, even though the ecosystem is, is much less developed than Singapore. So can you uh, explain the two columns of, of numbers? So there's the, the company uh, the, name. It's, one is in ringgit and the other is US dollars. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, I got this, it. That's yeah. All, yeah. And then the, the, the second column Local is just the. Local currency in US dollar. That's right. Um, so what have we done uh, as Tech Growth Ventures in Malaysia? Three years ago, um, uh, I actually partnered with MDEC, which is the IT agency of Malaysia. And uh, we brought a, a group of mentors from Silicon Valley to go to Malaysia to help mentor about 35 startups. Um, they are typically early stage startups. So we did uh, you know, hands-on uh, workshops with them. And then when we came back, I, I organized a bunch of meetups where I brought Silicon Valley professionals to, together to listen to pitches from selected uh, Malaysian companies over Skype. You know, I just felt that there was a need to try to bridge some of the problems that I saw earlier by matching these Malaysian companies with co-founders here or partners here at an early stage so that they can together build a cross-border company. I believe that's the way to solve these kinds of problems over time is how do you create a cross-border company? Cross-border means that you have co-founders that come from different countries, right? It means you're, you know, you're registered in multiple countries and therefore you, you, know, you have market presence. You have a network that is uh, cross-border. So that was my attempt at trying to get that going. Um, and then uh, more recently this year, uh, as I said, uh, Magic is the agency that's been launched in April, which is basically a one-stop shop entrepreneur agency. Their job is to create a startup ecosystem. And when they launched in April, Obama was actually in Malaysia. That was the Second time a U.S. president has actually visited Malaysia. The previous time was 40 plus years ago. And so it was uh, coincidental. He was there. He helped launch the Magic Center. Uh, and there's actually an oval in front of this huge building. It's called the Obama Oval. Um, uh, so ne next week, actually, there is a group of um, 30 Malaysian startups that's going to be here at Stanford uh, for a two-week uh, immersion and networking uh, program. So it's going to be taught by uh, two Stanford professors. Uh, they're going to be here, and uh, Tech Growth Ventures, we are going to be hosting them to talk about uh, lean U.S. market entry. How do you enter the U.S. market in a lean way, right? So let us know if you're interested to meet some of these startups, because I think it would be good to 
you know, explore opportunities with them. So summarizing what are the Asian uh, startup, uh, the Southeast Asian startup trends. One, as I said, is rapid regional ecosystem development over the last couple of years. I would say only the last three years it has been rapid and is led by Singapore. Uh, government are key enablers. Um, it's very interesting, uh, as I said, to, to find out when governments should step back, right? When is the right time for them to step back? And already in Singapore, you're starting to see some of these tensions in terms of when governments try to over-engineer the startup ecosystem, there are some unexpected um, effects, what that, what that does. Uh, you also have situations where startups in Singapore says, the hell with it, I'm not gonna Go, I'm not going to be over-engineered anymore. I'm going to become an American company. And then the government starts to panic. It says, oh no, we're losing our, our gems. Right? So it's a two-way two street. Uh, market fragmentation is a key challenge. Uh, it's sort of like Europe, where you've got 10 countries, culturally very different. Um, uh, Development-wise, some difference, right? Malaysia and Sing Singapore are very developed, or well, not very, more developed. And then you've got the biggest ones, uh, Philippines and Indonesia, are much less developed. So you've got different stages of economic development, uh, cultural differences, as I said. And of course, the way of doing business in these countries are still very much built based on relationships. So if you wanted to sell into, let's say, corporations in Indonesia or Malaysia or in Singapore, it's a whole different way of entering the market each and every time that you have to re restart. So challenge fragmentation is a problem. A uh, growing number of exits, as you've seen, a uh, new wave of investors. In summary, I would say the ecosystem is still not sustainable. Um, I'm curious to find out uh, later on from you guys, which ecosystem do you think is sustainable outside of Silicon Valley? I mean, startup ecosystem. Well, in, in, in Southeast Asia, it's still not sustainable yet. So there's still work that needs to be done by the government and by people like us to try to prop it up. And the model of a collaboration between Southeast Asia startup ecosystem and the US is still evolving. There are only some early players like us and others that are trying to bridge these ecosystems. But what's the business model? Is that business model sustainable? It's still to be seen. Okay. So this is now to Tech Growth Ventures, right? right? Right. So this is us. So we're based in Santa Clara. Um, and uh, our job is to basically to help uh, as I said, U.S. companies enter the Southeast Asian market and vice versa. So here in the U.S., uh, we have a center set, set up where we do workshops, we do mentorship, we do seminars, funding pitches, and, uh, and others. So we select uh, Southeast Asian companies that we think have good potential, good technology, decent teams, all growth stage. So we don't look at companies that are just early stage companies. And then we help them get into the U.S. market. And uh, it's not just distribution. Right? It is all, all about finding co-founders if they need it, finding funding when they're ready and have traction. Um, it is about finding strategic partners that help them validate their business. So uh, in Asia, we have, uh, we have partners where we have got a similar presence out in Asia. You know, overall, our goal is we're very business development oriented. We're not education, we're not events. We're about helping them build a business traction, either in the US or in, Malay uh, in, in uh, Southeast Asia. And over time, we want to build a portfolio of these companies that are from the US or Southeast Asia where we have equity. That's our model. We're also raising a venture fund. Uh, we're in the process of doing that now. Sorry, go ahead. Are you adding any value on the technical side and the, the engineering side? Or is it mostly not customer not, development not and fundraising? As, not as much on the technical side. Um, there's always a need in some cases. So Southeast Asian com uh, countries, a lot of them, do not have enough talent that have global experience, right? Let's say running a global cloud platform. Uh, and so if they come here, they will help them build a team to do that. But we won't, that's not the core part of what we do. And certainly we don't do technical outsourcing. We don't help them do the engineering as well. Is, is, I don't, I, was that your question? Yeah, we don't do that. But there's a need. To me, the need is not so much about having large teams, because in Southeast Asia, you can have large teams. But it's about having people with global experience. That would come from here. Are you also looking at U.S. companies to take to Asia? Yes, and I'll give you a, a case so study in detail okay. uh, about wh what kind of companies mm -hmm. sort of a, is a good match. Um, uh, so I won't go into too much detail about this, but we have a structured outcome-based success sharing program, I call it, right? Structured in the sense that we really walk through companies into various stages. The idea there is just to try to mitigate risk. Um, 
when a Southeast Asian company wants to enter the U.S. market, even though they already have product and revenue and they're ready for Series A, but if, without traction, without partnerships, without anything in the U.S., we don't even know whether they're competitive, whether the business model needs to be tweaked, uh, whether the product features need to be tweaked because of product market fit. So we walk them through various steps of assessment and validation for six months before we even say, okay, we're going to now look for funding for you guys. That's the last step, one, the third step. So we really go through a structured way of assessing what the opportunity is, validating it here in the U.S. for six months, getting enough traction that convinces both of us that there's value. And then finally, we help them scale, which is look for funding. Um, outcome based in the sense that we are really targeting business milestones. You know, if you don't get to the business milestone, there's no point in, in, in continuing to work with this company. So we're not a outcome only. I mean, not just a, hey, you know, let's do the demo day and we're, you know, we're done, right? We're just there to actually build traction when we work with you. Um, so some of our Southeast Asian companies, just to give you an idea of the companies we work with, in Malaysia, uh, there's an enterprise workflow software company. There is an enterprise BI company, uh, Joget and Data Micron. In Singapore, I mentioned Quantine, the video interviewing platform software company, a cloud security company called Cl Cl Cloud. And even in Brunei, there's some startups that are coming in mobile education and anonymous messaging. And then the Philippines, mobile fraud management. So all these companies are growth stage companies, and they're sort of at the same situation as I mentioned for uh, in, in just now. Um, in the U.S., we also so in the U.S., what we do is we look for companies uh, that are also growth stage that have a potential for the Southeast Asia specific market, right? So Southeast Asia, as I said, infrastructure build out, right? On growing middle class, number of online users growing. There's a unique set of uh, opportunities that we try to match U.S. companies to. Um, especially when we look at, in the U.S. now, there are so many seed fund companies that a lot of them are hitting the Series A crunch. And when they reach Series A crunch, we try to help them match them up with opportunities in Southeast Asia. That includes partners, that includes customers, and that includes funding, a lot of which is, of course, government subsidized. And I'll give you a specific case study of what that means. So this is a great win-win in the sense that there are many U.S. companies that are saying, help me, you know, either I recapitalize in the U.S. or I expand. And when I expand, I don't know where to go. Should I go to China? Should I go to Southeast Asia? So, so these are some of the considerations the U.S. companies are, are having. So we have a portfolio of these types of U.S. companies, and I'll actually talk about one case study. But in general, they cover infotech like this to electronics, uh, to energy and environment. I won't go through all of these, but it's very it's quite broad in terms of our portfolio. So let me talk about the case study, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll try to wrap it up. So here is a, a US um, LED technology company. So they have a portfolio of patents, 57 patents. Uh, they, they basically invented uh, AC LEDs, which is uh, alternating current LEDs. Typically, LEDs, majority of them are DC powered. But they've actually invented how to do it with AC, which means you can now plug the light directly into the socket rather than going through a conversion. So that lowers the cost of the components, it lowers the, the failure rate of the components, and of course allows more interesting form factors of the light to be developed. Right? The world is going LED, and these guys are saying that the world will, will move back to AC, which is a lot more convenient. They've been, they have a small round of, a, a small round of investment. Um, They've got a small product business of their own, but what they're sitting on is a large portfolio of patents, and they're only one of two holders in the world of these types of AC LED patents. So they've tried to actually um, uh, get more investment in the US. They're not getting it. Why? Because investors here don't like hardware. Okay? Uh, they've tried to get acquired, but unfortunately, the AC LED market has not grown fast enough such that an acquirer will say, hey, I'm going to pay X hundred million dollars for this, for these patents. So what we do is we say, wait, let me help you evaluate whether there are um, opportunities in Asia. Are there acquirers in Asia or are there joint venture partners in Asia? And this is an active deal that we're working on. So what we've done is we've actually started matching them up with the, in Shenzhen in China, 70% of the, of the LED manufacturers are actually, 70% of the world output of LED comes from Shenzhen. So we've started matching them up with joint venture partners in China. 
And we've also started to do the same in Malaysia. Malaysia has a pretty active manufacturing sector. 40% of the GDP output of Malaysia is actually manufacturing sector. And so we've tried to match them up with a bunch of manufacturers in, uh, in Malaysia as well. So it's a joint venture kind of a model in a sense that they're going to build a new operating company. Uh, manufacturers that want to have access to the patents would get uh, licenses to actually manufacture it for this particular segment of ACLEDs. In return, they must invest in this joint venture, $5 million and above. So we're building up a whole IP holding company for ACLED. The investors are actually manufacturers that want to have exclusive manufacturing rights. And then on top of that, we're getting governments to come in and start to invest in this whole en entity. So it's a deal like this that sounds very complex, but it's just an example of, of a, a pipeline of deals where we say we find very good uh, technology from the US, good products, good team, but they're struggling. They're struggling because they cannot survive in the US and we're trying to bring them to Asia using a model which, which could work. So this is what we've done with them. Uh, finally, I will just say, this, uh, I will summarize by saying here are some of the opportunities for bridging uh, uh, Southeast Asian and the US startup ecosystem. The strategic benefits of doing so are, number one, as I said, there's a large greenfield market. Um, there are business incentives that the governments are offering, everything from tax holidays to uh, subsidizing operating costs, to you know, grants, matching funds that are available, IP protection. Um, just because some of the countries in Southeast Asia come from a British colonial background, they do inherit some of these uh, legal systems. So there's a lot better uh, IP protection compared to other parts of Asia. Strategic partnerships. Um, what I mean here is that because the individual countries in Southeast Asia are smaller, the companies there and the governments there are a lot more opening to real strategic partnerships as opposed to we have such a large domestic market, we can be global players and you guys, if you come in, you're just going to be you know, a junior partner to us. It's not like that in Southeast Asia. When you go to Southeast Asia and you look to build a partnership, these people look to the US as being a strategic partner and they're willing to, 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 to do it. It's a talent hub, there's a lot of talent there. And it's a low cost, uh, obviously it's a very low cost uh, site. Um, not only in terms of manpower is low cost, but advertising is super low cost, one tenth of that in the US. Um, so ways of doing the bridging, I would say one good way of doing it is really startups immersion. What I mean by that is just like Startup Chile, where the country of Chile down in South America is getting startups from the US to go there for a couple of months, Singapore and Malaysia are starting to do that. They're really trying to create incentives for startups to be co-working together for a couple of months so that hopefully they find and build cross-border cross companies. Cross-border networking, we just don't see enough of it. If you look at all the various associations for networking in, in Silicon Valley, how many of them actually have a Southeast Asian presence? Very few, if any. Um, cross-border accelerators, we're starting to see some. Founder Institute is there, Bootstrap Labs is there, Plug and Play is there, and we are there. So we're starting to see cross-border accelerators uh, focusing. And then investors as well. Golden Gate, Elixir Capital, Sovereign Capital, Seamer Ventures are all US VCs that actually now have a site fund in Southeast Asia. So I think collectively, if we do a bunch of these things, we should be able to bridge these ecosystems a lot more uh, in the future. So that's what I had today. Thank you very much for your time. We do have some time for questions. I sure. want to ask you, TGV, yeah. is um, what kind of a business model are you working with? Are you taking an equity position in the company? Are you it's, actually it's a, success, an investor? success sharing and, and, um, and an equity model. Okay. Uh, until we raise our, our own fund, uh, we cannot invest in it. So we syndicate yeah. investments and we get an equity portion of the business. But we, for the deals, commercial deals that we cut, we also get a, a revenue share. Yeah, okay. So th those two models, succession, uh, commission and uh, equity based. Okay, great. How did you get into this from being a venture, on, you know, on your own serial entrepreneur and so forth? Um, about seven years ago, um, uh, I started working with startups uh, uh, to help them do business development, companies that are trying to get into the US from Europe or from Asia. Uh, and then I joined uh, as a mentor in plug and play, and I really saw how a very large scalable accelerator works. 
and then Founder Institute as well. Both of these have over a thousand companies already under their umbrella, more than a thousand actually. So I saw, wow, these guys really are trying to innovate a business model around acceleration. And that's why I wanted to try and do it myself. In this case, I chose Southeast Asia because there's just not enough attention, I, fe I feel, to that region. Everybody's focused on China or India, but Southeast Asia still has a lot of greenfield opportunity. Okay, and the next question is, to what extent do you really have to look at Southeast <laughs> Asia as something where you have to do it country by country, but you really need to go to all 10 in order to have a sufficient market? I mean, we haven't talked much about Thailand. We haven't talked right. much about Vietnam. Right, right. You know, and those are big markets. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, 90 million people in Vietnam. That's right. And they're one of these places that has a 90% you yeah. know, uh, penetration rate for cell phones. Right, right. So uh, do you really think through and say, okay, we'll start in Singapore because, you know, done in Bradstreet, the ease of doing business index, they always show up number one or number two is the place where it's easiest to do business in the whole world. Yeah. yeah. And so that's a great place to start, but then you got to have a strategy. For is the question in the context of a U.S. company going there or a tech growth ventures, meaning us, or is it in the context of a Asian company? I'm thinking of either a U.S. company startup that would want to go okay. into Southeast Asia or possibly an Asia company. Oh, right, right. But right. Not, not TGV itself. I understand. Um, you know, I would say that if you're an American company, uh, you would want to go to either Singapore because you want to have a place which is the hub, right? And it's a hub for all these things I mentioned. The networking, the VCs are there, the accelerators are there, the government is very, very supportive. Uh, if you want to have a lower cost place, then you will go to Malaysia, right? Uh, it has a fourth of the cost of Singapore, basically. But these other places, once you establish a, an initial presence in either Singapore or Malaysia, then you absolutely want to go after the big markets. Uh, and usually you do that, the next one would be Indonesia, yeah. before they go into Vietnam, yeah. right? Or, or the Philippines. Uh, but in terms of whether they're all one at a time, unfortunately, as I said, due to fragmentation, mm -hmm. in reality, it's still one at a time, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, let's say you sell into consumer market in Indonesia. Uh, the consumer mobile market in Indonesia, well, guess what? You still have to go through telecom cell because they are the ones that has the marketing dollars to get access to that group. Yeah. And so you have to find your way into telecom cell, right? The, the, the tried and true way. Uh, uh, there is something called an ASEAN economic community that's being built, uh, launched next year in 2015. It's basically an economic grouping of the 10 countries. Uh, although it will be launched next year, a lot of people believe that it's going to take many more years beyond that to really have effect in terms of you know, consolidated legal systems and, and free flow of jobs and stuff like that. But well, it will help. About it. The European community started in, what, 1957 or something? <laughs> and unification, EU unification happened in 92 or something like that. Yeah, and it, it took finally they get a common currency in 2000. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah, it does take a long so time. So the reality is still, it's, it's still the fragmentation problem, right? But in terms of yeah. where you would start first, you would start in places which has the most, the friendliest to set up and do business. And then it does offer you the ability to then get into the other markets. If you went to Indonesia first, for example, in Jakarta, yeah. it'll, it'll still be a bit of the Wild West, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you'd, you'd have to talk to five different government agencies to find out whether you have a license to do this or yeah. not, right? Whereas in Singapore, it's like, you know who to go to, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's open the floor. Yes. How do you uh, evaluate to the language that's like a Malaysian language and Indonesian language are kind of similar so they can be looked at uh, uh, together, this kind of thing? Yeah, it's, it's a good point. Uh, Bahasa Indonesia and Bahasa Melayu from Malaysia are very similar, right? So there is an advantage, therefore, if you set up shop in Malay, Malaysia, you have a ready pool of Malay speakers that could easily converse with Indonesians, right? So there is that benefit, right? you know, 200 plus million people in Indonesia and, and Malaysia with 28 million. So there's some benefit if you do it that way. But otherwise, language-wise, you know, Thai is very different from Vietnamese, which is very different from Filipino. Uh, there are countries like the Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, where English is widely spoken, so that helps. There is a talent pool of English speakers that are in these three large countries. Uh, in Indonesia, English is probably less, they're less capable there, right? But otherwise, English is okay in three of the countries, and then Malay in two, but everything else is quite fragmented language-wise. Okay. You haven't really touched on Vietnam. 
It has some of the most um, educated engineers and some of the yeah. biggest startups in the whole of Southeast Asia. What are your thoughts as to its future? Yeah, I, I, we have not been in, in uh, Vietnam as yet. Uh, that's why I, I didn't cover it. And it's also uh, not the largest, not the most developed from an ecosystem standpoint. Uh, certainly, you know, hopefully we want to focus there next time, but we haven't focused on that. So I've got a couple of comments on that because we've featured Vietnam several times in our spring entrepreneurship series. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that stands out to me was a person who said that you have to win in the market there. You can't go in and expect to survive as number two. It's a very much an all or nothing market in Vietnam. Uh, certain areas are more subject to corruption. And so you have to be careful about that, especially as an American business, if you get involved in corruption, you can be put into jail here, right? For bri bribing somebody in a different country. Uh, so Vietnam is difficult. There's a real active um, early adopter group, but they tend to be doing things not exactly at bottom of the pyramid, but kind of close to bottom of the pyramid. There's an awful lot of internet use, but it's mostly from internet cafes still. Mm. So uh, it's mm. an interesting place, but I noticed that you didn't mention Vietnam. Yeah. And I think that in terms of a Southeast Asia strategy, you develop the places where you can develop, you keep increasing your own resources and that makes it easier in the next, the more difficult markets. Hey, Peter. Um, in one of your charts on the exits, um, there was a big pool that um, was uh, uh, exiting in Hong Kong or related to Hong Kong. So is that um, uh, companies going into China through Hong Kong, or is it just China exits that use Hong Kong for tax purposes? Yeah, I didn't focus on the Hong Kong piece. That was the largest. Uh, the total uh, acquisition is the largest out of Hong Kong. Uh, I didn't go into that just because it's outside of Southeast Asia, but I can point you to the report, and then you can go into detail as to what is the nature of those deals. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Can you describe a, kind of a typical entrepreneur in uh, Southeast Asia? And what have you found are maybe their biggest misunderstandings about startups or being entrepreneurs? Yeah, you know, there's still, um, you know, like most Asians, right, uh, uh, they're very conservative. Um, uh, parents do not encourage people to take risk out of college, right? And there's still a lot of stigma of failure. Uh, in places like Singapore, where there's a lot more uh, development of the ecosystem, there's now several waves of entrepreneurs that have actually been educated and, and given incentives and, and all that. Um, so, the typical, and the, so the typical entrepreneur is basically you know, people in their uh, 20s or 30s that are out you know, doing their, their first startup. Uh, they're generally less, obviously less experienced at doing this compared to, the, you know, here, they're, they're people that try it typically five to eight times, right, easily. Over there, they're trying it for the first time. So there are a lot of first-time mistakes that they're, that they're going to make. So I've heard investors going in there and saying that, um, uh, that when they, inv and these people have, in have investment experience here and, and, and in Southeast Asia, they basically are coming across many, many teams that are first-time entrepreneurs, right, compared to here where there are still some repeat entrepreneurs, right? And so they make a lot of first-time mistakes. Uh, generally, they are willing to take the risk. Uh, they lament the fact that uh, when they're time for growth stage and they're looking for growth stage funding, there's still a Series A gap in Southeast Asia. But the gap there is for a different reason. The gap exists here just because of Series A VC is being disrupted by the seed investors, right? And they're therefore moving downstream. There, the, that Series A investment just never existed, right? In large numbers. So it's, it's a gap. And so they, the startups lament the fact that these VCs don't exist when it's time for them to, to get investment. But now, you know, there's some M&A that they can point to to show that, hey, you know, over the last six years, a certain number of M&As have happened, although the valuations are still low. But at least there are some success stories, and so then the cycle starts to repeat. You now have repeat entrepreneurs who have been successful through the early, earlier exits that are now VCs that are now starting their second or third venture. So it's starting to, to turn, right? Uh, but, but that's the nature of the ecosystem right now. So would you say that the entrepreneurs are, on average, about the same age as they are here? A little older, a little younger? Younger. 
I would say. Younger. Okay. Yeah. Okay. A lot of it is uh, because a lot of the successes and the opportunities are in the online and mm -hmm. mobile space. Uh, where it's very low cost, anybody can get it going, right? It's unlike here where there's a lot of enterprise opportunities yeah. which require a lot more veterans that run those kinds of companies, security, you know, yeah, supply right. chain. You don't think of, of a B2B idea unless you've got some B experience, yeah. Right, exactly, okay. exactly. Yeah. Okay, I saw your hand next. How, uh, how do you see the uh, ASEAN integration, AIC, if you start from the US company, do you have any particular impact, uh, something like the uh, and and commerce you're talking about, or I don't know. So so this integrated, now it's fragmented, right? Yes, that's right. And heterogeneous. That's right. Those countries. But uh, is there any specific market which is going to be integrated very fast? Or if uh, with regard to payments in particular? Or e commerce? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. You know, I, I would say that. Uh, uh, surprisingly, Philippines has one of the most uh, developed mobile payments markets in the region, if not the world, just because of the fact that a lot of people there are unbanked and, and mobile adoption has been so early there in the Philippines and they have a larger domestic population, close to 100 million. So they've innovated like crazy and they've had mobile payments for the last 10 years, I think, or more. And you know, here we're struggling with Apple Pay. Right and and whatever currency, okay, being hacked, you know. So these guys have innovated like crazy. So I think if any kind of integration happens, it'll be by the leading countries like that in the payment space in the Philippines or the more developed countries like Singapore, where you know the infrastructure and the regulatory framework is really there for them to to drive this type of integration. But but payment integration across the region is still a big opportunity because it just doesn't you know doesn't work in other countries like Thailand and Indonesia and others. Okay, I saw a hand over here. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Another question. Um, so, in the Malaysia um, general area, do you see a lot of um, interest or development in new areas like wearable electronics or internet of things stuff? That kind of part of it? Yeah, so we are actually working to try to get a uh, consortium of companies in Malaysia interested in um, sort of the hardware accelerator model, like you see starting here uh, and in China. Um, you know, at the government level, I would say that despite the fact that in the electronics industry in Malaysia, as I said, represents 40% of the output of the Malaysia, however, they're usually just supply chain to the multinationals, the Intels and the AMDs and all these other guys that are in the region. So they, they do want to get ahead of the curve in front of wearables and IoT and all that stuff. But uh, it's, it's, it's a typical thing, right? When you run a big factory and someone says, here's a hardware accelerator model and I'm going to give you a whole bunch of startups in all these spaces, they'll say, so what's the volume projection for next year, right? <laughs> you know, and so therefore, when we're trying to do a deal like the AC LED joint venture that I just mentioned as a case study, we have to get the government involved because in that country, the, we have to sell it as, hey, Malaysia, how would you like to own an IP pool Right, that gives you that, that allows all Malaysian manufacturers to have a control of the ecosystem as it evolves globally, and not be a fast follower to China, let alone complete follower to the U.S. And paying out all your technology license fees to some foreign country. exactly. Yeah. And so the the governments, because we have access to some of these uh, uh, decision makers in the various government agencies that I mentioned they will listen, they will take the meeting. And when we come to them and say, hey, we are a Silicon Valley accelerator, we have access to a portfolio of, 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 prop, of IP, how would you like to, and we have to sell them the whole strategy, right? You are going to be able to create a few global players in the, in the LED space. How would you like to do that? Rather than just you know, throw a couple of billion dollars at, at some companies that continue to manufacture for other people. So it's that kind of positioning, and I would say opportunity still exists. So that kind of leads me to a question, and that is the two of the old, you know, sort of workhorses for yeah. uh, Southeast Asia, services like call center services right. or other IT services, right. and also contract manufacturing, right. did not enter into your presentation. Right, right. Are you finding that those industries have generated people with an interest in entrepreneurship, or is it really a new set of people? Um, it, it, it is a new set of people, right? I mean, contract manufacturing in Malaysia has been around for a while. Yeah. I mean, Intel has been there for 40 plus years, so the ecosystem that supports it has been around the for, that, for that long. The industry That's right. really centered And there. outsourcing has been a focus by, by MDEC for the last 
10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is already established. So when I talk about startups, ecosystem, the new yeah. stuff, that's all the stuff that's different from these two. It's different from yeah. services, it's different mm -hmm. from contract manufacturing. It is about, about online and mobile and social and, and all of these other, and hardware, right? There's an interest in hardware too. Um, it's just that from a, from an ecosystem perspective, just uh, just to elaborate a little bit more on the, on the let's let's say you know is is IoT and wearables is that going to be a big thing in Malaysia? We have to work extra hard at building a business case to do it. Uh, unlike let's say Taiwan or China, where you know the ecosystem is big enough, right? There is interest to do that, so they can invest small parts of money and say, hey, let's invest in this new growth area. Whereas in Malaysia, it's not big enough that they can invest, right? They're still following where the supply chain is going. Primarily looking at the global market because of the size of the local market. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, so, your hand? Yeah. 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 I was just curious, uh, as far as Bill Fellow, uh, your answer to his question about uh, working with governments and helping people find partners, do you sort of follow like the plug and play model where they like work with EDB and bring people here and then use them as a, a sort of a on the ground assistance to set up a an on the ground incubator or to develop a business on the ground in Singapore or the region? We, um, yeah, we are, we're trying to do that. I will say that, you know, in the, in the country, so we've been actively engaging with Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, Philippines, right? I didn't mention Brunei and Philippines just because I'm out of time. Uh, but um, every, uh, every startup ecosystem is at a different stage. Singapore is, is, is advanced enough that they know who to work with. Right? And if they come, they have a very specific requirement. And if you meet that requirement, then you're their partner. I mean, their government's partner, right? Malaysia is still evolving, and so they're open to them outsourcing a whole chunk of their startup development, bridging you know, work to you, right? Brunei is like so small, right, that they're just starting to figure out, and they're doing wholesale outsourcing end-to-end -end of the of startup ecosystem build-out, which we are helping them with. So it varies. Uh, there is no cookie-cutter kind of a model. Uh, we're small enough and boutique enough that we can try to pick and choose what are the what are the deals we do compared to a plug and play, which is really about scale, right? Uh, you know, I won't go into detail about the model, but the model is all: hey, we've got the building, 500 companies are going to be in there. Mr. Government, you want to come? You know, here's the sponsorship package, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. So uh, this reminds me of, <laughs> of a company that I was advising, and suddenly they got an offer from someone in Brunei. Right, okay. very high up, who was going to do some Royce. financing, financing <laughs> into the company, but it was going to be through Islamic financing, okay. you know, models. Right, right, right. And finding an expert who could go through the, the <laughs> all of the conditions and make yeah. sure it was a good deal or not was really hard. In Brunei, you mean? Well, yeah. the, the the proposal came from Brunei. The company oh, itself was in Japan. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, it was fascinating because finding somebody who understood Islamic financing was right. practically non-existent. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of knowledge there in Malaysia. Actually, Malaysia is one yeah. of the countries that led the creation of Islamic financing, mm -hmm. and so that's why they're growing the space in the Middle East and Brunei as well. You know, you mentioned Brunei. I mean, we help uh, some of the companies that are in our program are from Brunei. Uh, Brunei, of course, is just like Dubai. They're trying to diversify away from oil, right? They know oil is going to run out or U.S. is going to outproduce them or something. And so they needed to diversify into tech. So they've built an incubator, partner, partnering with Singapore, actually, to build an incubator. And they need people like us to help do that bridging with Silicon Valley. And um, it's very interesting because when we were there in June, they were about to pass Sharia law. I don't know whether you know what Sharia law is. Sharia law is really a more stricter version of, of Islamic legal system within Brunei and you know every you know people within the tech community in Brunei, the small tech community in Brunei were panicking and say oh no now people won't invest in us anymore because we follow Sharia law in Brunei and I told them that there are a lot of other reasons why US companies won't invest in you don't worry about Sharia law <laughs> <laughs> that's the least thing you should worry about <laughs> you know you worry about market traction <laughs> So to the limits of my understanding, in Islamic financing, you cannot charge interest because that's considered usury in Islam. So what happens is you have all of these procedures for something that kind of looks like an equity warrant yeah, yeah. that is yet guaranteed for return. And so you know the valuation of the investment wow. and so forth, you need somebody who's really expert in that. Right. Um, yeah. Question? Mm -hmm. Okay, 
Can you talk a little bit about the payment, mobile payment in like Philippines and uh, uh, Singapore? Are they similar to Apple Pay in this kind of thing? Um, yeah, probably we'll have, maybe you can do that during the networking session. Uh, we did a project with uh, Smart Telecom, which is the number one mobile operator in the Philippines with over 90 million subscribers. And they're one of the innovators, right, in mobile payments. Uh, they've been able to use their phone and their phone number to load up credits from their real bank accounts and do payments for the last 10 plus years, right? Um, and of course, they've started to now expand into NFC and, and other technologies that enable more seamless payments, right? The project we worked with them on is mobile fraud management. Uh, mobile fraud is actually very big uh, in, uh, fraud anyway, is very big in, in, in Asia. In fact, the biggest market for fraud is in the US as we know, but uh, in Asia is very big too. So they had a solution where they could, you could connect up all your debit, credit type accounts into your phone number and, and set various thresholds on all of these accounts, like amount transacted, time of transaction, locality of transaction, and venue of transaction, such that when these thresholds are exceeded, you get an alert on your phone. And then you have to approve it. So it's part of the payment cycle, right? You have to approve it before that debit or credit or whatever transaction can happen. And so they pioneered that just because they've done so much mobile payment on phones that they realize that now this capability is because of the growing growth of fraud is happening. Uh, but we can talk a little bit more offline and we can tell you a little bit about that. So most of the regional yeah. business development in Southeast Asia, do you think that will carry it? That maybe plus the U.S. The reason I'm asking is do you think uh, the general slowdown of GDP in China is going to negatively impact Southeast Asia business opportunities a lot? Uh, if you talk about the traditional businesses, like yeah. contract manufacturing, outsourcing, yeah. all that stuff that feeds into China mm -hmm. as well, of course yeah. it would get impacted, right? Uh -huh. um, uh, if you talk about, uh, I mean, there's another dynamic there that that perhaps they're starting to see, and this, this came from a, a Japanese uh, investor. So there are a lot of, I don't know whether you, you remember from the slides, but there are a couple of new Japanese VCs that are now in Southeast Asia. And so mm -hmm. we asked one of them, why, why are you interested in Southeast Asia? So beyond the usual green field and all of that, yeah. his answer was interesting. I'm pivoting away from China. So I said, why are you pivoting away from China? He said, well, it's slowing down. And then number two, there are now geopolitical pressures between got, China yeah. and Japan. Yeah. And so he says, because of that, a lot of the things that we try to do are much, much harder when we try to do it with China. So we have to go back to Southeast Asia. Jap the Japanese mm -hmm. were in Southeast Asia, if you remember, back in the 70s or 80s, oh, yeah. big time, right? The Asian tigers were born just because Japan and later on, Korea and others started, or Taiwan, or started moving some of the manufacturing to Southeast Asia, which is a lot more lower cost. Now the cycle is repeated, but now in the online space. You know, these VCs are there to invest in all those greenfield opportunities I showed you on that eye chart, because they say, well, you know, Southeast Asia is where Japan was, you know, 15 years ago. So I can make bets as to which segment is going to grow next. And so that's why he's investing. That's a Exactly. Yeah. So that, this is why it's a repeat, right? So that's why the Japanese are there. And so this pivot away from China is a theme that I'm seeing. Uh, I don't know yeah. whether you're seeing some of the press, right? Well, you what know. the countries will say is yeah. China plus one. That was Vietnam's big push, right? <laughs> the so plus one is don't Vietnam. Don't just look at China, but look at us too. Uh, and right. so, you know, I do think whether it's a pivot or whether it's an expansion to hedge risk, Yeah. you know, you, you're seeing both. Yeah. And I think the general point for all business everywhere is that you cannot assume that the current distribution of economic power is a stable thing. Yeah. You know, it's going to be changing. And yeah. so watching what happens in this area as more money flows into it is really important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think the, um, you know, one of the topics that you wanted to cover in our talk was about the rise of the global startup yeah. and, and where does the Southeast Asia players stand. As I mentioned, right? there is enough help from certain ecosystems to, to, to have a large pool of early stage companies. Mm -hmm. When they get the growth stage, they struggle with the three strategic options that I mentioned. Do yeah. they become an American company? Do they go to China? Or do they become just a regional player and get bought yeah. out? Yeah. And those are the three things that they struggle with. And a lot of them can't make it past that chasm, yeah. right? Just because they're like, you know, I can't get the funding and I didn't know which strategy option to take when I spend my time doing one, it fails and then they're out of time. But on the other hand, 
in a sense, that's three options. Mm -hmm. A lot of people only see two of those three, period, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. other places, right? Yeah. So I think that you know, yeah. seeing more options is a good thing. So, they, so other places they lose the China option. Is that your point? No, they lose the Southeast Asia option. Right, right, right. That's they either fair. Think That's a US good point. Or they think China. That's right. a good point. In in Southeast Asia, most of the M and A has happened just because they've stayed as a regional player. They've got market share in Indonesia, in Malaysia. Boom, they got bought out by Groupon. Right. It's a sub fifty million dollar exit, but hey, you know, five million went into it. So, good. Are you seeing any uh, human resources shortages? For this kind of thing, are I mean, so a lot of entrepreneurs are first-time entrepreneurs. Yes. What about the people who come to work in the companies? Are they able to get the technical people they need? Are they able to? You know, I um, I have not heard about you know a shortage in engineering like okay. I've, like a, mm -hmm. like you see here. Um, probably UX people and design people. There's a shortage of of quality people there. Uh, as I said, you know, chief architect kind of roles, people with global experience running global platforms, you get much fewer of those. Um, so that's where they would, we are encouraging some of these Southeast Asian companies to, to partner with professionals here in the Valley mm -hmm. to fill those gaps, yeah. right? People that have UX experience, people that have growth hacking experience, people that have these types of, um, uh, run, you know, running large platforms types of experience. And, mm -hmm. You know, co-founders are very difficult. You, anybody has started a company that tries to find a co-founder to do it, will we'll live through that. It's very hard to find co-founders. It's almost like it's harder than getting married. But you know, but but you just imagine if you are a Southeast Asian company and you're a Silicon Valley company or professional like all of us here, and you're trying to figure out, hey, should I do a cross-border company? What does that mean, right? Can we make this global, right? Do we just become a China player, which is big enough, by the way? Very big in it, in, of, in and of itself, right? So, you know, the, the talent gaps are because of these things, right? Yeah, yeah. design, uh, architecting. Okay. By the way, the, but the cost of the rest of the team is super low. I mean, yeah. uh, like I said, advertising costs on Facebook and YouTube are one tenth in Asia compared to what they are in the U.S. The cost of talent of hiring people in Malaysia is forty percent cheaper than Singapore, right? Which is very expensive. So, and then I haven't mentioned Vietnam, where they're much cheaper, and Philippines, which is even cheaper, right? So, again, English educated, I mean, English speaking, you know, workers, right? Okay, well, let's move our session offline now to the networking. <laughs> and uh, please join me. Winston, thanks for a great session. That was really informative. Right. Thank Wonderful. You. Thanks for having Thank me. You. Thank you.